Thank you. Right. I'd also like to flag to you, and this becomes more and more apparent as I go through my work in the MB200 syllabus, that the course as provided by Microsoft and the exam appear to be quite different. So any of you who have not yet done this, please do download either from a link that I've previously provided or by Googling the skills measured document for MB200. Even if you have done the full blown five day course, you really do need that skills measured and you need to go through that to make sure that you know that you are confident with all the components. The top level of that skills measured document is what we've got there. And the percentages, even though they are bands, are rough breakdown of your time that you should spend revising. They also are an approximate breakdown to how the marks in the exam are going to be scheduled or going to be split up across the six areas. So for example, if you decide that you don't like, you really don't understand about solutions, deployment and testing, you fundamentally are limiting your marks to an absolute maximum probably of 75%. So that is probably not a good move. What we are looking at today is how you implement security in the Power Platform and Dynamics 365. And just as a reminder, that is somewhere between 5 and 10% of the total. Having said that, when you look at how complex it is, I think that's a little bit mean. But then if they were to up that, they'd have to reduce some of the others. There are two broad chunks of content that you need to be aware of as far as the security in Power Platform Dynamics 365 is concerned. The first is the security within Office 365. And the second is the security settings inside Dynamics 365 itself. So the office side is a lower part in terms of overall understanding than the Dynamics 365. So inside the office 365, there are one set of roles that each user needs to be allocated to. That is also where you create the users and where you allocate a license for Dynamics 365 and, of course, any other Office products that that user might need. If you give a user the a Dynamics 365 license, that will automatically create the user inside Dynamics 365 but it won't do anything else. So you then need to go in to the user's area in setting security of Dynamics 365 and give them the required security roles and one or two other things. But the big one is security roles. And that is probably the biggest thing you need to understand within security as a whole. To fully understand the options and all of the tools that you've got inside Dynamics 365 for security, you need to understand those five areas and business units. I don't know why they don't put business units on there, since business units are the foundation of the whole thing. There are three different types of security inside Dynamics 365. And those three are, first of all, role-based security. And that is largely 
the security that you get by creating, managing security roles and then giving one or more security roles to each of the users. Then we have record-based security. And record-based security is what you get either when a user shares a record or when you use access teams and access team profiles. And then the third and final is field level security. And that is when you grant or deny an individual user the ability to read, create in or update individual fields. And one of the key things about field level security is that you it does not in any way, shape or form use security roles. The reference on the bottom I have added to the reference list, which I will send out, maybe not tonight, but I will send an updated version of that out soon. So this is how the key components of the security model sit together. At the top, we have business units. Within and therefore beneath business units, we have security roles, users, and groups of users, which we call teams. And security roles are comprised of two intersecting concepts, privileges, which are things or actions that you can perform, and access levels, which are the records on which you can perform those actions based on the ownership of the record. So to put that all together, what we have there is a security model with one business unit, one root business unit, and four child business units. Notice that this child here could be thought of as a grandchild because it is a child of a child of the root, whereas these are just, these three are bona fide child business units. Inside business units, we have security roles. Out of the box, there are a lot more than two security roles, but two is enough to explain this diagram. And if I tried putting 15 onto that graphic, you wouldn't be able to make any sense out of it. What is important is that every business unit has exactly the same security roles in it, but they do, they are separate things inside Dynamics 365. What that also means is that you should only edit these two or these security roles. In other words, the roles in the root. If you edit the roles in the root, the changes that you make then percolate down to all the children. But if you start editing, so let's say we edited this marketing security role here, it would still be called the marketing security role, but it would be different to these and that would create no end of mess for maintenance. The next layer up on this model is our users. The key bit about this diagram is that users can have one or several security roles. So these people on this diagram we can assume only have the one security role. But this person and this person who I've got sitting across 
have got two or really several security roles. The next piece that you need to understand is a team. And that red loop represents a team. So in that team, we have got people from multiple business units and who have different security roles. And if that wasn't complicated enough, we can then give one or more security roles specifically to the team members. So this person here, this smiling Charlie, whose face I am now rubbing, has got the sales security role and the marketing security role here. And because he or she is a member of this red team, they have also got the VIP security role. These people do not have the VIP security role. So any questions about that diagram? And that diagram, or at least a variant of it, is another thing that I think those of you who are working to help clients ought to be able to reproduce. So I will leave it there just for another couple of seconds and then we'll move on. Jill, could you chat that I can see on my phone and anybody else because it's sort of obscuring the actual diagram? Ah, my fault. <laughs> I sit there. Okay, how's that? Much better. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so it's still on my screen, but it's up above. Um, I do have a question. Now, with the VIP security roles, um, does that override the other security roles that the team belongs to? Or does it sit alongside? Right, it sits alongside. No security role ever overrides another. So it's always additive. Okay. Okay. Security role cannot remove the ability to do anything. Okay, makes sense. Okay. So it's always additive. So this Charlie, who's getting his face polished again, has three security roles within the limitations of this diagram. He's got sales, marketing, and VIP. But it would be inappropriate to try and rank them. What that means is he can do everything that this Charlie can do. And if we assume that the security roles are the same, he can do everything that this Charlie can do. And he can, on top of that, he can do whatever the VIP security role gives him. So business units are the absolute foundation. They're also the first bit of the security model that you will set up. They might not be conceptually the first, but when you're building this for a client, you start with business units. Now, that's not to say that you can't go back later and create more. Absolutely, you can. But you, you, you need business units on which to put the other stuff. There is always one and only one root business unit. And child business units are optional. So a small organization or an organization who maybe isn't that small, but isn't very differentiated, may well only have the root business unit. But a bigger organization or one that's highly differentiated may have several. Business units are usually but not always geographic. So examples where you've got a northern business unit and a southern business unit are good examples. People that talk about the engineering business unit versus the manufacturing business unit is not really that good because the people in the engineering group, and I'm going to deliberately use a general term, 
really should get their functionality given to them by one or more security roles rather than the business unit. Having said that, those of you that do work with clients will come across lots of examples of more functional business units. Every user is part of one and only one business unit. So if you think back to the previous slide, every one of those smiley faces was inside a business unit. We didn't have any sitting on the linking bars or outside of business units. So we've talked now about the root business unit and child business unit. The root business unit is always and non-negotiably created when you create the org or in Power Platform, the environment. It's created by the overall install process. And it initially will always have the same name as the organization. It is technically possible, but probably not a good idea, to rename the root business unit. And this is another reason why when you're doing your scoping of a greenfield implementation, you need to get the org right up front because technically changing it where it's possible can generate issues. The root business unit cannot be deleted and also cannot have a parent. Child business units are almost exactly the opposite. So they have to be created by a system administrator or an implementer. Once they're created, they can be renamed and they can be renamed later on. They can be deleted as long as they don't have any users in them. So you need to move all the users out before you can delete a business unit. But when you think about it, that makes sense because we said a moment ago that every user has to be inside a business unit. And if we deleted the business unit from under the users, child business units must have a parent. So it's one of the fundamental differences between child and root. And a child business unit can be reparented. So if we go back to this diagram, if it made sense, I could move this business unit so that it was parented by one of these two. Or I could move it up here so that it was parented by the root. But I couldn't put it up here and leave it parentless. They are key questions for your overall understanding of the security model. Part two of the security model is users. And there's a couple of number of key points about users. If we're talking about Power Platform or Dynamics 365 online, users are initially created inside the office admin area. And that's where we give them their license. If we're talking about an on-prem instance, then we create the users inside whatever Active Directory is controlling that instance. And then outside of Dynamics 365, we'll give them the necessary licenses. And then we will create them inside Dynamics, but we create them by using their Active Directory name. You can't just create them completely from scratch because it is the Active Directory that does all of the authentication. And the creation is always done before you can bring them into 
Dynamics 365 for creating a user so that they can log in to Power Platform. They need to have, first of all, a license, which is what sets them up. Then inside Dynamics, they need to have an enabled account and they need to have at least one security role. So if you have a user without a security role, they will not even be able to log in to Dynamics 365. Okay, so security roles. And what security roles are is a matrix of privileges or actions and access levels, i.e. depth that you can perform that action and those two intersect. Security roles grant access or deny access to data and they also control the user interface. Now, they control the user interface in a couple of different ways. So the first way that they control the user interface, if we look, so this example here, document template. Now, as I run my laser pointer across, you see how this role has got minimal access. So this person can read but can't do anything else with document templates. If we removed read as well from this role, the whole concept of document template would disappear for a user that only had this security role. If you, the delete is a good example. So, here we've got records that this user can't delete. What that means is that any icons or menu options for deleting are just gone for that user. With four security roles, you get several, and it's now about 15, I think, that exist out of the box. And by out of the box, what I mean is you've set up your environment and created the org inside your dynamics. And just by doing that, you will have those 15 or whatever it is, security roles. All bar system administrator are configurable. System administrator gives very broad access and it cannot be changed. The other difference about system administrator is it will always have to have at least one person who has that role. So you cannot remove the last user from the system administrator role. So now we start delving into security role privileges and action um, and access levels. So there are eight privileges inside security roles and each of them is an action that you may be able to do to a record. The access levels, there are five of them. And I'm going to go through these in a bit more detail in a moment. But what the access levels show you is which records within each record type or entity based on the owner of those records, a person who has that security role can perform the action. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. Along the top here are the eight privileges or actions. So the things that we can do to records, we can create them, we can read them, we can write or update them, we can delete them, we can append them, we can append to them, we can assign them, 
or we can share them. They are the only things that you can do with records in Dynamics 365. Now, notice in here, if I've got the right choice, and I'm not sure that we have got, but there are five different levels of circle, and we'll go through those in a bit more detail. But this area here is the intersection for this particular security role, the CEO business manager, between the privileges here and the record types or entities here. But note also that this is one tab, the business management tab, out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And now there's another couple. This, this screenshot is a little bit old. To explain that in a little bit more detail, this dot there, which is a full circle, means that somebody with the CEO business manager role can read, because it's in the read column, all currency records, because it's in the currency row. We've gone through the eight privileges. So unless someone's got a question, I'm going to go straight over that. Jill, okay. do you mind sure. recapping the difference between append and append to? Sure. That one always catches people. Imagine you've got a contact and that contact needs to be given a parent account you would append the contact and you would append to the account. So again, going back to some of what we discussed last week, where you've got a parent-child, a one-to-many relationship, you append the child and you append to the parent. A sign is where you change an owner. So if I assign a record to you, it means I make you the owner. Now, I may or may not be the original owner. Again, that depends on my security as to whether I can assign stuff that I own or whether I can assign more broadly. But after I've done the assign to you, you are the owner. So now we're starting to look at the five access levels. If the access level that you've got is a quarter yellow pie, it means that you can do whatever action or privilege we're talking about only to records that you own. If you've got a half yellow pie, it means you can do that action to records that you own or that are owned by a member of your business unit. If we've got three quarters pie, you can do that action to records owned by you, a member of your business unit, or a member of a child business unit to your business unit. If you've got a full green pie, you can do whatever we're talking about to all records. And if you've got an empty red pie, you can't do it at all, or you can do it to no records. So does that lot make sense to you? Yes, thank you. Now, inside the security roles, the security role matrix, there are three areas. Some of the tabs do only have two areas, but overall we've got three areas. So we've got the standard privileges, which is where all the conversation to date has focused. Then we've got privacy related privileges and miscellaneous privileges. So if we go back, right. So here, this area here is the standard privileges and it's the standard privileges that also have these 
options here. In the privacy related privileges, they don't have the actions, but if you look at what they are, so this one, CRM for mobile, that means somebody with the CEO business manager role can install the mobile client for CRM. Now, some of these will have changed a bit. These screenshots are a couple of years old. That person will also be able to do stuff inside document generation. And then down here, we've got the miscellaneous privileges. And miscellaneous privileges, as the name suggests, is a whole load of stuff that doesn't fit anywhere else. So it's well worth becoming familiar with what is in the privacy and the miscellaneous. Okay, time for you to do some work. Have a look at that, give it some thought, and then come back to me. And this does require some understanding of gamification. I don't know why they chose this, but they did. <laughs> the correct answers. And a bit more about gamification, bearing in mind that the gamification is effectively an add-on to Dynamics 365. The first one is actually global admin because you're doing stuff outside Dynamics. So although Dynamics 365 system administrator has very high powers, those powers don't extend outside Dynamics 365 and gamification is an add-on to that. So the first one is the global administrator. Is that the Office 365 global admin? Yes. Oh, okay. Which is now, by the way, called the Microsoft, Microsoft 365 yep. global admin. Just because they can, they did. <laughs> they like to keep us on our toes, huh? And the rest. Um, the second one is Dynamics to Sadman. Yeah. Right. Okay. Game manager? Correct. So there you go. There's the answers. And that, I'll just leave that on the screen. And those of you that want it in detail can either grab it now or get it off the recording later on. I'm not going to read that to you. Now, a bit more. And this one's probably a slightly better question. So what do you need to configure server-side sync? Global uh, admin as well. Yep, because we said that's done outside mm -hmm. of Dynamics. And configure a new Dynamic 365 instance. System admin. Actually, the service administrator. Okay. The service administrator was new to me. So they're the correct answers. Think I where think you need to do this. this. Think where you need to do this. Either global or service. <laughs> I think now trying to nab two out of four is a bit naughty. <laughs> um, Go on, throw your money in the ring. Which way? Admin. Well done. Have your $50 back. <laughs> what about add new accounts? Yeah. Yeah. They're the answers. Okay, so in summary, when you're managing users, you start by setting them up in Office, you allocate the license in Office, you assign or allocate security roles in Dynamics, and some fields within the user area can only be edited inside Office. With this slide as well, if you are dealing with on-prem, Everywhere where I've said office, you can substitute that with Active Directory or wherever the Active Directory is controlled. So another question. So if you had a user that gets married and changes their name, 
would going into the active mailbox and changing the name update the site no. name no no it would have to be managed in office 365 and not dynamic 365 correct so but let what you're saying is correct but if we focus on the question all we need to say as far as this question is concerned is if we do go into the active mailbox and change the name, have we achieved the goal? And as a couple of you have said, the answer is a resounding no. So here's another variant on it. So same woman, married the same other dude. <laughs> and now we're going into dynamics and changing the username. Does that solve the problem? Anyone want to put $50 on yes? Oh, shucks. Yeah. You're all right. So, again, that doesn't work. And that one's the same, so we'll ignore that. And how about this one, then? Yes. Yep. Hundred dollars? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> well done. <laughs> okay. So now we are looking at teams. And a team is a group of users. And as we saw earlier, those users can come from one or multiple business units they those users can have any combination of security roles that they've already got and they can also have a team can also have its own security role so the vip security role in that diagram i introduced much earlier was an example of a security role applied to a team. Teams also can own records, but there is a bit of a gotcha there. One of the things that we looked at, I think, last week was in views, a number of entities, if they are user or team owned, they automatically get the my views in the my whatever so let's say my accounts we'll drop the active because that's not relevant to this question if we had a view called my accounts what would the filter criteria in behind that be? so which accounts does the my accounts view display accounts on the <laughs> yes now can you give the exact the account accounts where you are the record owner. Yes, that's true. But when you go into build that view, the query that you're going to build, if you were building it, and this obviously isn't out of the box, or the query you would see if you look at it, would be owner equals current user. Mm. Okay. And that means we can all have the my accounts view. But when I open it, I see the records that I own. You open it, you see the records that you own. However, even if we work for the same organization and we're in the same team, we would not see the records owned by the team. Mm -hmm. Because in those records, the ones that I own, there is a user field, and that's populated in essence with Jill Walker. Does that make sense? Whereas the ones that you own, the owner field is populated with your name. So Karen Scott Davy, Kim Davenport, whatever is appropriate. None of those records are populated with the VIP team or whatever team we have to be in. And those records that are owned, if any, by the VIP team 
at risk of stating the obvious, do not have in their owner field Jill Walker, Kim Davenport, Karen Scott Davy, or whatever, because they have VIP team. So that is a really good gotcha. That the my accounts or my whatever do not show those records that are owned by a team of which you are a member. So does that go on to say that when you create a team, you need to create a view specific for that team as well? Or? Probably. Okay. So this is where planning your security model, your record ownership, your views and the configuration, there's a little bit of work Okay, so now we're looking at field security. And field security is where you add specific security onto an individual field. And through that security, you allow a person or a group of people to read the data that's in it, to edit the data that's in it, or to create data in the field. You can add field level security to almost any field in the system, but not all. There are a few fields where the functionality that I'm about to discuss with you is invisible. And so those fields cannot have field security, but that's a small minority. By default, field security is disabled for all fields. And to turn it on, you open it through whatever technique you want to make any other change to that field and turn the field security option to enabled. Field security is one of those options that you can turn on, turn off, turn on, turn off, whatever you need. One of the key differences between field security and some of the other areas, some of the other techniques of hiding data from users is that once the field security has been applied, a user that doesn't have the appropriate field security access to that field will never see that data. So you can't get around it by do it, running a report or going into advanced find or anything else. If there is a field security profile that doesn't allow you to see that field, you cannot see that field. End of story. So then, sorry, you're, I think you must be a long way from your microphone. Sorry, well. no. I was saying, just for your security, then take incident over record level security. Um, well, yes, it does, because the record level security applies to the whole record. Mm -hmm. And then on top of this, we've got certain fields are screened off. So imagine a situation where, and this is an example I like to use, somewhere in the system, and we'll, I'm gonna put it on the order, we create a credit card field. So we're going to allow our users to pay for these orders by credit card. And we want people to process the orders down the track. They might be working in the warehouse, but we don't want them to see all the credit card data. So we would achieve that. Their security role would allow them to see all or some of the orders, but the field security profile would deny them access to the credit card number or other credit card data fields. Does that make sense? It's also very important to remember that these are entirely independent from security roles. 
and you work with them by creating a field security profile. And then in the legacy system, and I believe also in the current system, you create field security profiles in settings security. Obviously, this screenshot is from the legacy, but I think it's almost identical in Power Platform. And what we've got here is a particular field security profile. And the particular profile is called demo. And then what we've got is certain fields here. So we've added in certain fields and then along here we are granting read, update and create rights to those fields. And then the other side of the field security profile is the members that can be either users or teams. So once we've added some users or some teams, those people can read, update, or create the fields in the profile as per those three column permissions. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm going to move on. So some questions for you. What are the four well, I'm more than happy to have an early night. I've done eight hours training before I logged on to this one. Field security and field yeah. role and security roles. Yep. Role security. Okay. The third is records. So we've got role security, which is effectively security roles. Record security, which is sharing and access teams and then field security that we've just the four key components are business units users and security roles and teams that is the minimum number of business units in the organization one correct right. And what happens if a user without a security role attempts to log in? Will be denied. Okay, they can't essentially, so they fail, and they get an error message that they can then bring support and bitch about. <laughs> I've access levels inside security roles. Read a pen, pen, There's eight of those. Uh, it, um, user. Yeah, you're right. It's that no. one. User, the user and the team, then the user, the business unit, and then. <laughs> yeah. All I remember is seeing one trunk, what a yellow color pie. <laughs> Might as well, right? So that's that. And then this is where you were going earlier. So the eight privileges or actions, but there they are. What you Yep. So the way I have it there is so append is what you do to the child, and two is what you do to the parent. And last but not least, why is the system administrator security role not configurable? Um, because this is the main role that you start with, isn't it? That you run the system on. Correct. Um, oh, you can hear me. My mic is playing up. Mm. Someone has it's to like have the root uh, role that was necessary to run. <laughs> well, someone has got to get to do those things. Yeah. So that's why you can't change it. 
and why there is always one or more than one person that has that role. I will call it a day.